Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. It's quite an honor to be with such a diverse and talented group. Um, my name is John Lind, and I'm a glaucoma specialist here at Indiana University School of Medicine in the United States. And um, my topic today to discuss with you is incorporating glaucoma clinical trials into clinical decision making. So first and foremost, I'm a clinician. I take care of a lot of patients with glaucoma. Um, a little bit about my background. So I'm an associate professor of ophthalmology. I did my residency in St. Louis at St. Louis University in 2008 and my glaucoma fellowship at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in 2009. Right now I serve as the director of adult clinical ophthalmology and assistant director of medical student education. But once again, my primary focus is on glaucoma clinical care. So conflict of interest um, regarding the uh, information uh, presented in this uh, presentation. I was an investigator uh, in the OATS-3 trial, which we will be discussing, as well as the primary two versus trabeculectomy trial. So um, I do have some interest, I guess, in, in those studies, uh, but my goal is to prevent, present an unbiased view of all the clinical trials and, and try to, to really hit the high points and, and give you some take-home messages uh, regarding uh, a lot of clinical trials, not just these two. So the objectives uh, of today's presentation is to learn how to incorporate glaucoma clinical trials into everyday practice and to analyze current glaucoma trial results and understand the main conclusion. So there's a lot that goes into this, um, both in uh, planning clinical trials, as well as uh, reporting on the results, uh, as well as you know, incorporating the results into our a daily clinical care uh, of our patients. So, um, you know, uh, we'll go over a lot of different factors uh, as well as specific trials uh, during this presentation. So some things to keep in mind um, during this presentation, and this is specifically useful for this group um, because you're from all around the world and I'm biased, uh, my bias is that I'm going to be presenting studies that were predominantly centered in North America and Europe um, uh, and clinical trials that I use because they most commonly mirror my uh, patient population. Now, fortunately, we have some other trials that aren't that are uh, centered in other parts of the world that we'll be presenting today. Um, but um, when I present kind of how I use clinical trials uh, during this presentation, uh, I'll try to point out times where I say, well, this may not necessarily represent the patient that's sitting across from me uh, that I'm trying to take care of. Um, some other study factors. Um, so it's important to reconcile what stage of glaucoma that these clinical trials are, are being, um, that th th they're um, recruiting participants for. So you know, certainly different clinical trials will have patients at all different stages of glaucoma. Some are focused only on ocular hypertension, some are focused on early glaucoma, and some will be focused on later glaucoma. So it's important to realize kind of what your target pressure is, what the, the likelihood of success with different interventions may be um, when trying to incorporate um, uh, the results of clinical trials to help your patients. Another really important factor we've already spoken on is, is patient demographics. So, you know, is this a very diverse population? Is this the type of population that sits in front of you in your clinic? Um, also, there are other patient factors that are, that are important uh, to consider. So, you know, is, does this patient come from, you know, three hours away and has trouble with follow-up appointments? And, you know, do they have trouble getting their medicine and using their medicine? You know, all around the world, we have these issues. Um, and so, you know, it's important to, um, you may have the best intervention in the world, but if the patient can't um, um, do the intervention or, or participate and, and be followed correctly, that intervention may not be the best for the, for the patient. So, you know, understanding patient uh, situations, their current health, are they too sick for incisional surgery? Is there, are there other options that can be done for, for your patient? Um, and then I think, you know, most really good clinical studies have one predominant question that they're trying to answer. And so um, I, I think when I read studies, I always think, all right, well, what was the author trying to study when they set out to do this research? So I think that's always an important thing. You know, there are multiple conclusions and there are multiple um, uh, results that we all interpret uh, based on 
on study findings, but you know, really try to get at the heart at you know what was the basic question that the investigator was trying to study. This I think is really interesting. Uh, so this was a um, uh, paper presentation at the American Glaucoma Society a few meetings ago, and it's it kind of mirrors um, some of the factors that we were speaking about before. So. Uh, this is a great study, uh, really, you know, important surgical intervention study uh, that defines success um, as the intraocular pressure uh, post-treatment being 18 or below, um, uh, complete success without glaucoma medications and qualified success with medications. But if you actually look at the preoperative intraocular pressure uh, in the study, uh, the average intraocular pressure started out at 16.6. So obviously this is going to be a uh, highly successful study, whether the intervention works or not. Uh, so it's always important to look at the, uh, pre, um, the pre-intervention demographics as well as how success is defined uh, in each study. So um, always keep that in mind. Just don't go with the the you know one sentence hit that comes out of the study always try to be critical when assessing studies. The first study I'd like to discuss this morning is the ocular hypertension treatment study. So this was a study out of Washington University of St. Louis. Um, I was on faculty there for six years and was spearheaded by um, Michael Cass and May Gordon. And this study was conceived uh, in the 90s, uh, so many years ago. And the original study question was: Does treatment of ocular hypertension prevent primary open angle glaucoma. And so that was the heart of the study. And, and Dr. Cass is a wonderful clinician. And, you know, this was a big question uh, and, and still, um, you know, has, has a little bit of a question mark still. But I think that this study has really influenced a lot of our practice patterns uh, throughout the world. Um, it was a very large study. So there were uh, 1,636 patients randomized to medication versus observation to see if actually treating high eye pressure prevents open angle glaucoma. And fortunately, uh, we have 20 year results of the study, which are currently being analyzed and um, reported on, published. Um, so, you know, very, <laughs> it's very uh, rare in ophthalmology or in medicine to have 20 year results of any study, but Dr. Cass and team were able to uh, get demo or information, uh, follow up information on. Uh, almost a thousand patients uh, at 20 years. So uh, really, really a great study to help guide our, our practice patterns. So what were the baseline characteristics? So um, to enroll in the study, you had to be between 40 and 80 years old. Um, slight predominant uh, female population. Um, obviously you couldn't have glaucoma because that's what they were trying to study was conversion to glaucoma. They had a uh, slightly thick central corneal thickness. So um, one of the pre-meeting questions was, you know, the role of central corneal thickness, and we'll try to, to hit on uh, that uh, a few slides from now. 35% uh, of the patient population had a family history of glaucoma, and it was a relatively diverse patient population. Um, just baseline demographic or baseline uh, characteristics, uh, they had to have a normal uh, Humphrey visual field test normal optic nerve head and the pressure in the study eye had to be between uh, 24 and 32. You may ask, you know, why wasn't OCT in, in included? Well, back in the 90s, OT, OCT was a was a, uh, a study tool and, and not in clinical um, use. So, you know, if you were designing the study today with our current technology, certainly I think OCT would be a very important um, tool for a study like this. But in the 1990s, you know, OCT was, was being invented in Boston. So uh, that was not included in the study. So the there have been three OATS phases. So OATS phase one was looking at treatment versus observation. And the treatment group developed glaucoma at five years at a rate of 4.4%, while observation uh, group developed uh, a rate of developing glaucoma at approximately 10%. Um, so this showed that the risk of developing glaucoma was cut in half with treatment. In OATS phase two, uh, where they treated patients, they had an equal rate of developing glaucoma uh, in their original treatment versus the original observation group. Uh, and this was looking at the 10 year numbers. Um, so as described before, the risk of developing glaucoma with treatment was cut in a, approximately 50%, uh, but the number needed to treat 
to prevent one case of glaucoma was approximately 20. Um, so um, the 10-year study in the OATS-2 study um, really risk stratified patients. And it showed that there was greater benefit uh, to treating patients that were at severe risk of developing glaucoma, which is um, not surprising. Uh, so I think risk stratification is one of the major uh, results of the, of the OATS study. You know, not every ocular hypertension uh, patient that's sitting across from you is created equal. So you have to look at the patient and look at their risk factors. Um, you know, risk factors include thin central corneal thickness, um, patterns here and deviation, high cup to disc, family history. Um, so there are multiple uh, risks uh, that are involved with ocular hypertension. And um, if you go to uh, Google uh, Washington University, St. Louis, uh, OATS risk calculator, you can uh, look at your patient's uh, 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 risk for developing uh, glaucoma and individualize kind of your discussion with the patients. Um, the OATS three trial, which is a 20 year results, um, is just now being analyzed and, and published. So what are some of the major inclusions from the OATS three trial? So 46% of patients develop glaucoma at 20 years. Um, African-Americans uh, in the study uh, had a higher risk at 55% of cumulative incidence of development of glaucoma. Um, the patients that were originally treated had a lower risk of developing glaucoma at 20 years. 25% um, of patients had visual field loss. 3% um, had very severe visual field loss with a mean deviation of less than 22 decibels. About 8% of patients required uh, tube shunt surgery or tobeculectomy surgery. And 75% of the patients were on topical medications. And once again, the incidence of developing glaucoma um, uh, increased as the risk factors mounted. Uh, so patients at higher risk uh, tended to have a uh, higher development of primary opening glaucoma. So very influential study uh, conducted by uh, Dr. Michael Kass and team. Um, so what are the um, other take-home messages from OATS? So, um, so we discussed risk stratification is very important in making clinical decision. Um, we know that central corneal thickness, so thin central corneal thickness tends to underestimate eye pressure um, and so this was rediscovered. It was actually known and published on well before the OAT study uh, by Dr. Argus, uh, uh, I think during his fellowship at Iowa. Uh, but um, central corneal thickness was kind of rediscovered as, a, as a, a risk of its own, a thin central corneal thickness for development of uh, primary opening glaucoma. Um, we also found through subsequent studies that um, cataract extraction is very good at lowering intraocular pressures in ocular hypertensive uh, patients. So um, at least for a few years, you know, the effects of cataract surgery in most patients, the pressure lowering effects uh, tend to wear off over time. We've also learned through the study and the multiple uh, stereoscopic uh, disc photos and, and visual field tests that were done routinely and analyzed, that's important to confirm visual field defects. So if someone has a new uh, uh, or uh, uh, progressed visual field defect, you know, not necessarily in the OATS trial, but it's always important to confirm that the defects are actually uh, there. Um, we know that chances are more than not that uh, visual field defects are, are not confirmed on repeat visual field testing. Uh, so it's very, very important to uh, confirm visual field defects uh, to make sure that what you're seeing is actually true, especially if it doesn't fit the clinical you know, scenario. If your OCTs are stable and your optic nerve is stable and the pressure seems well controlled, they might have progressive glaucoma, but um, it could just be a bad day of taking visual fields. So um, always confirm, you always want to treat patients and not tests. Um, and then lastly, you know, glaucoma specialists, you know, as some of the best glaucoma specialists in the United States were involved in this trial. And this study showed that we're really bad uh, at picking up uh, optic disc hemorrhages. So it's very important to be critical in evaluating the optic nerve. Um, uh, you know, how do we know we were bad? Because in the study, uh, uh, investigators had to circle, is a disc hemorrhage present, yes or no? And uh, more times than not, uh, or sometimes when, when the doctor said no, and then the photos were taken, uh, disc uh, hemorrhages were on the photos, but the clinician did not pick that up. So very important to be very critical uh, in uh, assessing uh, optic nerve head status. So the next study that uh, we'd like to uh, speak on today is something called the selective laser trabeculoplasty versus eye drops 
for the first line treatment of ocular hypertension and glaucoma, the light trial, which was based in Europe. Uh, it was 718 eyes that were randomized to medications versus SLT. Uh, patients included um, uh, 18 years or older. Uh, they could have open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. The mean deviation had to be less than a minus 12 decibel, so kind of mild to moderate glaucoma. Um, and it excluded patients with intraocular surgery, except for patients that had cataract extraction more than one year prior. The average patient was on the younger side, 63. Uh, the vast majority of patients had open angle glaucoma, although 17% uh, of patients uh, were moderate to severe. So they, they accepted moderate and severe glaucoma in this trial. And then 23% had ocular hypertension. 70% were Caucasian, 20% uh, uh, were um, uh, patients of African descent and 7% Asian, 55% were male, 24% uh, was the average intraocular pressure and 6% of the patients were pseudophagic. So these are the baseline characteristics. Um, so here's some uh, information uh, regarding uh, treatment versus uh, observation. Uh, treatment versus control. So 75% uh, of the patients in the laser only group had one SLT, and we'll talk about why that's important. Uh, the medication burden was significantly reduced in the SLT group. Uh, both groups, uh, the eye drop group and the SLT group, had uh, greater than 90% uh, of the visits uh, at the target pressure. Uh, this is uh, part of the results at the, at the bottom of this chart. Um, disease progression was lower in the SLT group, 3.8% versus 5.8%. And the patients in the eye drop group were more likely to have surgery, uh, both cataract surgery and trabeculectomy surgery, as uh, highlighted by the, uh, the chart at the very bottom. What were the clinical endpoints in the visit? So um, the vision, intraocular pressure, and visual fields were maintained well in both groups at three years. And excluding the two-week SLT visit, the total number of visits were similar in both groups. So um, it wasn't an increased uh, clinical burden to do SLT versus um, uh, drop treatment. So um, what were some uh, adverse events? So, so most uh, adverse events were uh, limited and, and transient. Um, this trial did look at uh, systemic side effects uh, with uh, the eye drop group and more you know, localized side effects with the SLT group. But as you can see, the um, uh, groups were pretty well matched uh, as far as uh, limited and, and transient uh, complications. So one thing that was studied was also repeat SLT. So um, there was good survival of repeat SLT uh, compared to initial SLT. So this is something that we'll come back to in the conclusion slide, but I found this to be very interesting and, and has uh, changed my practice. So some take home points from the light trial. So patients should be offered, in my opinion, laser trabeculoplasty as a primary therapy. So, you know, this study I think has changed practice patterns. Um, you know, laser trabeculoplasty works in the majority of patients. Um, patients still need to be monitored and it, it needs to be uh, explained that this is not a cure for glaucoma or, or high eye pressure because we do know that the effects wear off. But uh, many times if patients have trouble getting eye drops in or, or even in patients that can do eye drops, um, patients should be offered laser trabeculoplasty uh, and, um, and encouraged if, if they do wanna go that way. Um, patients with severe disease were less likely to be controlled in both the medication and laser group. So that was in one of the charts earlier, um, but as the disease became more severe, um, hitting pressure goals uh, with both SLT and drops um, uh, uh, was decreased. So um, I think we see that clinically where you know many times if we try an intervention on more severe disease, whether it's MIG surgery or SLT or, or drops as, as indicated in this trial as well. Uh, the efficacy is just usually not as good, unfortunately. Um, one thing that's changed is considering repeat SLT, even if no prolonged effect from the first laser. So I was taught um, you know, almost 15 years ago that if you didn't get an effect of an SLT, don't go back to the well. Um, it was unlikely to work a second time if it didn't work a first time. But this study shows that, and, and I um, do do this in my own practice, you know, I'll say, you know, unfortunately with the one SLT, you weren't part of the 70 or 80 percent of patients that normally respond. But new uh, evidence shows that um, repeating the SLT, there's a, a percentage of patients that tend to do well with repeat SLT. So um, I've had a few patients that we've repeated SLT on, and, and um, this is really a, a big take home point for me from the study. Uh, also, laser trabeculoplasty is a cost-effective alternative 
to drops. And then the, the authors make a, a point to say that maybe we don't need to do a earlier than one month visit following SLT. Now, I think that generally that's probably true. Now, certainly if a patient has a history of a pressure spike, if they have very severe glaucoma, uh, uh, that you're worried that pressure spike might cause a problem if they're monocular. Um, you know, sometimes I'll see patients three or four days after SLT just to make sure they don't have a pressure spike. But um, really the, the chance of a pressure spike in the study was very, very low, uh, which I think is reassuring. Um, the next trial that I'd like to discuss is a ZAP trial which was a single site perspective trial of 889 patients that received LPI and then the other eye was observed. So it was a six year trial, um, which is um, a really good link trial, uh, maybe not good compared to the OATS trial, but six years is a, a good length of, of, of keeping a patient in a trial. Um, the inclusion criteria, so the patients were uh, between 50 and 70. They had to be primary angle closure suspect with greater than 180 degrees of appositional closure without ocular hypertension, sneaky eye, or optic neuropathy. Um, and then they did have an exclusion criteria of a, a greater than 15 millimeter rise in interocular pressure with dilation or darkroom provocation testing. Um, so the eyes that were studied in this trial uh, were sh uh, short in length. Um, they had mild hyperopia with a cup to disc of approximately 0.4. So once again, you could not have had uh, glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Um, so these are the Kaplan-Meier uh, plot endpoints. So there are three endpoints to this trial. And as you can see, the proportion uh, that reached primary outcome was extraordinarily low. Uh, the three endpoints were an interocular pressure at a couple of visits, uh, greater than 24, more than one clock hour of PAS that developed a peripheral anterior sneaky eye, or an acute angle closure glaucoma attack. So what was the incidence per 100, or sorry, per 1,000 eye years? So reaching endpoint of uh, the pressure uh, endpoint, uh, there was a 0.66 per 1,000 eye years incidence in patients that had uh, laser iridotomy versus a 1.11 incidence per 1,000 eye years in, in the control eye uh, where they had not had an iridotomy. Uh, similar, uh, per, you know, reduction uh, or with uh, PAS formation in acute angle closure. So the incidence of all three endpoints was extremely low uh, at six years, but reduced in the iridotomy versus um, observational eyes. So when you compare the eyes that did and did not reach endpoint, which eyes tended to, uh, what, were, what were the uh, differences? Uh, in the eyes that tended to reach endpoint. So, you know, it was a risk that if you didn't get an LPI that, that uh, you were likely to reach an, an endpoint more frequently. Um, other factors were age. Uh, so the older you were, the um, more likely you were to reach endpoint. Um, and then um, uh, if you had a, a, a smaller anterior chamber depth, um, you were more likely uh, to uh, reach endpoint as well. So um, these were looking at different uh, factors in this trial. Um, the good news is there's very low risk to doing iridotomies. Uh, there was hyphema, which we all see, uh, very uh, rare risk of a pressure spike or corneal burn. Uh, endothelial density didn't seem affected uh, by iridotomy, which is important to note, especially with glaucoma interventions these days, it's important to, to note that. So some really useful information coming out of this trial. Um, so in follow-up, um, what, what changed with an iridotomy? So the angles seemed to deepen with LPIs, um, uh, and the eyes that did not have an LPI tended to shallow over time. Uh, but the vision and interocular pressures stayed pretty similar in both groups at six years. So um, what are the take-home points from the ZAP trial? So I, I always chuckle to say, well, you probably do too many peripheral iridotomies. Um, you know, I don't, but you, you, you probably do. But, um, you know, I probably do too many too. Um, when you're sitting across from a patient, um, if they look really, really shallow, if they have risk factors, if you don't think that they're going to need cataract surgery soon, um, you know, if they have other risks that you're really worried about them going into angle closure or, or other risks, you know, sometimes because the intervention is low risk, uh, you know, we probably as a group do do too many iridotomies. But, um, the risk can be vision threatening, so uh, that might skew how many iridotomies that we do. Um, 
the patient population in this study probably doesn't match what I see here at Indiana. Um, and then, you know, some questions. So is six years really long enough to look for necessity of PI? And I think the answer to that um, is, when does a patient need cataract surgery? So, you know, if a patient's really, really shallow uh, and has appositional closure and they're 50 and have a clear lens, uh, you know, I might be more likely to do a LPI than a patient that's, you know, 69 and, and um, you know, has a two to three plus NSC with a vision of 2040, which I'm thinking about taking their cataract out. So, you know, trying to stratify once again, which patients need that, that's the the, the tough part of being a doctor sometimes is trying to, to put yourself in the patient's shoes and trying to feel out, you know, what their risk aversion is, uh, both to intervention versus observation, uh, and trying to figure out what's best for them individually. Um, and once again, just talking to them about the um, risks and benefits alternatives to the procedure. And, um, you know, I'm not paternalistic as a physician. So, you know, many times I say, you know, both options are reasonable. You know, I try to do my best, at, as we all do, to educate our patients. Uh, and then having them have buy-in into what they choose and answering any questions that they have. Um, the next uh, study that I'd like to speak on is the effectiveness of early lens extraction uh, for the treatment of primary angle, uh, angle uh, glaucoma or the EAGLE study. So this was 419 eyes that were randomized to clear lens extraction versus LPI. So um, different study population, uh, obviously. Uh, these were 50 years or older patients with no visually significant cataracts. So that's very, very important to realize. These were clear lens exchanges, or sorry, clear lens extractions, not exchanges. Uh, uh, they had to have primary angle closure with a pressure of more than 30 or primary angle closure glaucoma. So uh, they had to have one of those uh, diagnoses. Uh, they could not have a, a symptomatic cataract uh, or be post uh, LPI or have a past uh, history of um, uh, acute angle closure glaucoma. So uh, the average patient uh, was 67, uh, slightly predominant uh, female po population. Average pressure was 30. Um, the axial length, uh, once again, shorter eyes uh, with a, a mild hyperopic pres uh, prescription, but um, mean deviation on visual field was a minus 3.3 decibels. At three years, um, eyes that had clear lens extraction had less medications. Uh, had less likely a uh, need to have glaucoma surgery, which is great news, and had better quality of life. So um, as you can see from the results uh, uh, presented, uh, the clear lens exchange is in the first column, the laser peripheral iridotomy is in the um, uh, second column. So um, medication burden was less like we discussed and, and um, uh, needing a trabeculectomy. Um, there were six patients in the LPI group that ended up getting trabeculectomy. There were actually 16 people that ended up getting cataract surgery, uh, and then one patient with a, a, an Ahmed tube, um, it looks like. And so um, here, you know, clear lens extraction really had benefits to both intraocular pressure, medication burden, uh, and quality of life, which is what we all uh, try to improve with our glaucoma patients. So very low complication rates. 1% um, posterior capsular rupture rate, um, about one in 200 had vitreous loss. It was interesting that in this trial, um, malignant glaucoma actually occurred more commonly in the LPI group compared to the clear lens extraction group. Um, obviously being a hyperopic population, puts you at increased risk with any sort of intervention. Uh, but as you can see, uh, both groups had pretty uh, low risk. Um, also interesting, um, loss of um, uh, vision was higher uh, in the LPI group compared to the uh, clear lens extraction group. So what are take-home points from the EAGLE trial? So clear lens uh, extraction can greatly improve intraocular pressure, uh, lower medication burden uh, compared with LPI. And in the United States, at least, we struggle with this because of the challenge to um, uh, convince uh, insurances, government, that clear lens extraction is a potentially uh, great treatment for a potentially blinding disease uh, such as glaucoma. So um, that's a challenge that we have here in the United States. You know, other countries are more pr progressive, I think, uh, in relationship to this. So, um, you know, clear lens extraction can definitely be a 
glaucoma treatment, certainly. I think the study is a really nice study that shows this. So right now we're going to, to get a little um, interactive. So um, I have a couple of quick questions. So the first quick question is, um, and we'll give you about 30 seconds to vote. We'll put up the, the voting uh, in just a second, but it's a 50 year old uh, with neovascular glaucoma presents on maximum tolerating medical therapy with a pressure of 40 and a vision of 2080. So unfortunately I get multiple of these patients a month. Um, what is the most appropriate surgical therapy in this patient. So we'll put up the choices. We'll give you um, um, at least 15, 20 seconds to vote. We'll go over the results and then uh, we'll go over a study that kind of, uh, I think addresses this question. All right, so um, kind of all over the place on this. Uh, most people wouldn't do a Zen. Uh, I would certainly agree with that. And then uh, between Ahmed, trabeculectomy, Barvelt, uh, there's kind of a split decision with Ahmed's winning. And I would go with the majority here, uh, frankly, and I'll try to tell you why uh, with reviewing the next trial. So um, let's look at the um, next um, a trial that we're going to speak on. And um, these were parallel trials that pooled the results uh, because they were so similar in nature and they were run about the same time. So the Ahmed uh, Barvelt comparison study, or the ABC trial, which was spearheaded by Don Budenz, who's now the chairman at the University of North Carolina, uh, but he did this work uh, predominantly when he was a uh, glaucoma specialist at Bassam Palmer. And then Ike Ahmed uh, at the University of Toronto uh, conducted the Ahmed versus Barvelt study. But these were both multi centered, prospective uh, international clinical trials that randomized patients to Ahmed FP7 versus Barvelt 350 tube implants. So patients had to be over 18 and had to have uncontrolled intraocular pressure. So this was a very high risk patient population. So 65 years old, average intraocular pressure 32 on over three medications on average, um, and a fairly diverse patient population, which is once again, great to see. 50% um, of patients had POAG, um, but about 40% of patients had what's considered high-risk glaucoma. So neovascular glaucoma, UVA glaucoma. You know, traditionally tube shunt surgeries were reserved for high-risk um, uh, populations. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think some physicians uh, kind of felt like, well, tube shunts don't work as well as TRABs, uh, but the study populations, I think in those earlier studies were difficult uh, patient population. So um, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit with some other studies down the road, but, um, but this was a very high risk, high pressure um, uh, patient population with, with bad diagnoses. Um, so what did the IOP and the pool data show? So it showed that Barvelt's achieved lower pressures. So you can see um, uh, pressures were typically below 15 with a Barvelt and slightly above 15 in the Ahmed group. Uh, but at five years, pressure control was, was really pretty good um, in this pool data. Survival rates over time, at five years, Barvelt seemed to do better uh, as a whole, uh, but Ahmed's also did very well at five years as well. Uh, but Barvelt's statistically significantly better with less medication usage. So um, the Barvelt group tended to, to use about um, a half a medication less uh, compared to the Ahmed group. Uh, pretty much every time point. So what are take home points from this trial? So barbell implants had a higher likelihood of success, have lower intraocular pressure, had lower medication burden, but did have a higher incidence of complications and hypotony. A really important take home point in my opinion um, that has changed my um, practice was a result from the study as well that showed that in neovascular glaucoma, barbells had a much higher risk of progression to no light perception vision compared to Ahmed implants. So um, I uh, almost exclusively use um, Ahmed implants for this reason, not always, but um, uh, because I, I like the initial pressure lowering with Ahmed's, even I think it's more predictable than with fenestration of the barbell implants, as well as the fact that patients uh, tended not to have devastating complications um, in the neovascular glaucoma populations. So going back to our quick question, um, I'm biased probably to, to, to do an Ahmed implant in that situation. Uh, but um, you know, I think a Barvelt uh, implant uh, is also justifiable uh, in that situation, but uh, be aware of the serious complications with Barvelts in that 
patient population. Let's switch gears a little bit to the tube versus trabeculectomy group, which was spearheaded by Steve Getty at the Bassam Palmer Institute. tube. Um, this was uh, reported probably about 10 years ago, the, the final results, the five-year results. Um, but this was a study uh, of 212 eyes randomized to trabeculectomy versus a barbell 350. And patients had already had cataract extraction and or trabeculectomy. So uh, once again, uh, wide age range uh, pressures had to be between uh, 18 and 40. So let's look at the average patient. So 71 uh, with a pressure of 25 on three medications. 81% uh, of the patients had uh, open angle glaucoma um, and a very diverse patient population, uh, which is great. Uh, once again, this is a multinational study, uh, multi-centered study. So let's look at the five-year results of the TVT trial. So um, in this study, uh, trabeculectomy groups achieved lower intraocular pressures, um, but the, the tube group also achieved pressures uh, below 15 uh, throughout the, the five years of follow-up. So both uh, barbell to implantation and trabeculectomy achieved very low intraocular pressures, which was great. Um, failure rates, though, were higher in the trabeculectomy group uh, compared to the tube shunt group. Uh, so you can see them diverging at about six months and then kind of getting wider uh, throughout this, the study uh, protocol. What's the take home message from the TVT trial? So trabeculectomy was more likely to fail at five years. Trabeculectomy had a greater chance of reoperation in hypotony uh, than tube shunt surgery, which is the Barbell 350. Tube shunt surgery had a lower risk of serious complication. Trabeculectomy achieves a lower pressure with similar medication usage. Um, and perhaps trabeculectomy had a higher risk of failure uh, since 55% had undergone a prior trabeculectomy. So maybe the study population was a little skewed against trabeculectomy because um, a certain percentage of these patients had already failed a prior trabeculectomy. So, um, you know, I think this was a really big landmark study to show that tube shunt surgeries just weren't for refractory, um, you know, glaucoma as a last ditch effort, uh, which I think had been the predominant thought throughout the 80s and 90s, that tube shunt surgeries could be done after cataract surgery uh, and or failed trabeculectomy surgery. Um, you know, I think the probably among glaucoma specialists, it was to do three trabs first, and then if three trabs fail, then you do a tube shunt. But I think this study may have pushed tube shunts a little bit further up in the um, surgical uh, decision-making tree. So one more quick question. This is our last quick question of the day. So a 65-year-old surgical naive patient presents with progressive severe glaucoma despite SLT times two, a maximum tolerable medical therapy with an IOP of 18, what is the most appropriate surgical therapy? So we'll put up the poll here, give you 15 or 20 seconds to vote. We'll share the results and then we will discuss kind of some thoughts in, in a trial to maybe help us um, address this. All right, so here's some results. So, um, you know, it seems like that um, trabeculotomy with myomycin sees the the, I think, clear winner. Um, you know, I think there may be a couple of answers to this that I think are, are uh, um, reasonable, frankly, uh, but um, most people, I think, in this situation would go with the TRAB, uh, which is probably what I think is best based on this next clinical trial. So let's look at the primary two versus trabeculectomy or PTVT trial. So this was a study looking at 242 eyes randomized to trabeculectomy versus barbell 350. So I was an investigator in this trial. Um, and once again, this was spearheaded by Steve Getty at the Bassam Palmer Eye Institute. Um, <laughs> very similar uh, data collection uh, and uh, study design. Uh, but in this trial, patients could not have had prior intraocular surgery. Uh, so these were in surgically naive eyes. Um, the pressures uh, had to be, once again, between 18 and 40. Younger patient demographics. So with the TBT, it was 71 years old. Uh, here at 61. Uh, Interocular pressure is 24 on three medications. Very diverse patient population, which is great. 90% uh, of the patients had uh, primary open angle glaucoma. So the three-year results of the PTVT trial. So the five-year results are going to be presented by Dr. Getty at the um, American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting in November. Uh, but let's look at the published three-year results. So at three years, uh, tube shunt and trabeculectomy both lowered intraocular pressures well, uh, below 15, um, with trabeculectomy achieving lower intraocular pressures. Here's the difference, though. 
the trabeculectomy group had a uh, increased um, uh, uh, survival rate uh, compared to the tube group. So kind of the uh, uh, inverse results of the uh, TVT trial. So at three years, the, the tube group had a higher risk of failure. Um, so what are the take-home points so far with the PTVT trial? So um, at three years, tube shunt surgeries have a greater risk of failure have a higher intraocular pressure, have a higher rate of reoperation, um, and greater need for medications, um, but lower postoperative complications. So um, the complication rates in the TVT and the PTVT trial show bar belts tended to have less complications, but here um, there's a higher failure rate, um, which is different with this different uh, patient population. So um, there's a, a thought. So when you look at the different tertiles of starting intraocular pressure in this trial, patients failed at a much higher rate in the tube shunt group um, if they started out with lower intraocular pressure. So going back to the quick question, you know, the patient had that treated pressure of 18. Um, and, you know, the, this in this situation, um, trabeculect made based on the results of this trial and this patient population um, was able to achieve greater success compared to tube shunt surgeries. Um, you know, at higher pressures, tube shunts did very well in this trial, but there was a lot of failures in the lower tertile uh, patients that received tube shunts in the primary two versus trabeculectomy study. We'll see what the five-year results show, but um, just wanted to point out kind of a, a difference between the two trials. Um, one more study to, to speak on um, is the COMPARE study. So this is a, a really great study, uh, prospective randomized trial comparing hydrus to the two of the original iStent um, implants for standalone treatment. So this was not combined with cataract surgery, which a lot of the MIG sur uh, surgical trials are. Um, and so once again, this was a little bit off label in the United States because in the United States, uh, typically, we were limited to one eye stent implantation, but this included patients with two eye stents and once again, did not include cataract surgery. Uh, the inclusion criteria, so wide age uh, range, um, it, you had to have open angle glaucoma, but you could have pseudoexfoliation or pigment dispersion. Uh, intraocular pressure had to be between 23 and 39 uh, post uh, washout. Um, uh, kind of a younger patient population, uh, age of 67. Uh, pressure was 19 on 2.6 medications. Uh, diverse patient population, 94% of the patients had primary open angle glaucoma. So not a lot of pseudo-X uh, or pigment dispersion. Um, kind of the mild to moderate um, mean deviation loss on um, um, visual field testing. And 64% of these patients were phakic. Um, so important to note that. Um, so what did the study show? It showed that I, two eye stents um, versus one hydrus uh, had good pressure lowering reduction um, and reduced medication burden, although the hydrus tended to have slightly lower intraocular pressures and less medication use uh, over, the, over the, uh, the time course of the trial. I believe that there's um, new data being presented from this trial as well at next month's American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting. Uh, the safety profiles of both the hydrus and the eye stent were very good. Um, so some take home conclusions from the COMPARE trial. So both surgical modalities were really good at lowering pressure and reducing uh, medication burden. Um, the eye stent that was used in this trial was the quote unquote older generation where um, most of the time in the United States were not still using the same uh, eye stents that, that they were used in, in this trial. And that both surgeries had excellent uh, uh, safety profiles, which is very important, especially in minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. So some tips in analyzing clinical trials and incorporating results into your practice. Um, try to match patients with clinical scenarios when trying to assess recommendations to the patient. So, um, you know, I think giving patients some options uh, and kind of reviewing uh, some of the, the positives and negatives that these clinical trials have, have highlighted, I think are important in, in, uh, in giving patients uh, uh, empowering patients to, to pick which, which uh, option is best for them. Um, there are def definitely differences between studies. So it's, you can't really compare study to study because of patient pro populations, definitions of success. Um, and then obviously surgeon expertise and experience may dictate superior results. So, um, you know, um, most of the good trials are perspective, multi-centered, multi-surgeon trials. Um, but 
you know, your technique may be really good with one of the surgical options. And so, you know, that certainly should weigh in uh, your, um, uh, should weigh in in your decision making um, in, in recommending something uh, to your patients. So um, it's been such an honor to be able to speak with you um, uh, today, this morning here in the United States. Um, and uh, once again, uh, such a talented and diverse group. Um, I did want to take a couple of questions from the box and then we'll go ahead and sign off. So one of the questions was, what makes cataract surgery a good intraocular pressure uh, agent in patients with ocular hypertension? Um, what's the proposed mechanism? So, you know, I think that this is um, up a little bit for debate. Um, you know, some people have advocated that perhaps the ultrasound uh, does something to the trabecular meshwork to get the trabecular meshwork um, working better. Uh, you know, I think that um, some people propose that taking a big lens out uh, and um, putting a smaller lens in might somehow physically open the angle better. Um, I don't know that the mechanism is 100% uh, proven why it works. We do know the effects typically in, in studies that have looked at this tend to wear off over time. Uh, so maybe three to four years. Um, so I, I maybe someone else on the call knows, knows the answer, but I don't think that, that the mechanism has been uh, completely uh, uh, validated about why we think that happens. So, um, you know, I think there could be multiple multiple mechanisms that might might affect this. Um, so there was another question about how many times do you go back to SLT uh, before going to a different uh, therapy? So like I said before, I was always taught if SLT doesn't work in one eye, it's not gonna work in the other and don't try it again in the same eye. My practice has changed a little bit. So I would repeat the SLT probably twice um, uh, in the same eye. If I'm not getting an effect after the second eye, I know this is different than than some of the studies show, but um, then I usually go to a different intervention, uh, whether it might be an oral agent uh, or um, a surgical intervention, depending on the stage, the pressure, where, where we're at. Um, but, you know, I'll typically do it uh, tw if I'm not getting effects after the second SLT, I'll tend to, to move on to, a, to an alternative uh, therapy. So once again, thanks so much uh, for your attention. And it's my honor to, to help be a part of this program for CyberSight and Orbis. And, and uh, this is a, a really big honor for me to, to be with you today. So thanks so much. And everyone have a great day.